Welcome to the COVID-19 and hematologic malignancies expert insights webcast. Uh, we're now in our third uh, series as we do this six part series. We're in part three now as we look at what uh, this unfortunate pandemic has done to our practice in hematologic malignancies. Uh, my name is Dr. Joseph McHale. I'm a hematologist and a professor at the Translational Genomics Research Institute, which is an affiliate of City of Hope, and I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the International Myeloma Foundation. I am particularly pleased today to have a uh, international myeloma expert with me, uh, who happens also to be a very good friend, Dr. Nina Shaw. She's an associate professor at, the, at UCSF in San Francisco, uh, and she is joining me today as we focus this session um, in more detail as to how COVID-19 and this pandemic has influenced our specific practices with multiple myeloma. We want you to know, of course, that this is CME certified, all six parts of our series. You can obtain CME credit. So at the end of our session today, you'll be able to go online and provide us some feedback and obtain credit. It also gives you opportunity to submit questions because we have been accumulating questions with every week. Uh, and of course, this is such a changing dynamic in the way we're caring for our patients. We'd be happy to try and respond to your question. So let's uh, now turn to our guest, Nina. Uh, what a privilege to have you join me today. Thank you, Joe. I'm really happy to be here. It's always, uh, it's always good to see your face and always good to know that uh, you're there taking such great care of your patients in San Francisco. You know, we've been really trying to broaden our geographical reach with this series. And so we spent a lot of time in New York City and we interviewed John Leonard to speak a little bit about lymphoma. We've spent obviously some time with you already in San Francisco. Uh, in our part four, we're gonna spend a lot of time in Chicago and Seattle as we uh, discuss myeloid issues. But today we wanna to focus in on multiple myeloma. And, and I have a, a few questions I wanna ask with you, Nina, as you, as you reflect on how your practice has changed in the midst of this pandemic. And why don't we start with uh, the regimens that you're using? You know, there have been guidelines put out by ASH and by ASCO in the International Myeloma Society. It seems like everybody has guidelines as, as one commented last week, we seem to have more COVID experts than patients. <laughs> so a lot of people have been giving us guidance, but I'm interested in what Nina Shaw thinks and what Nina Shaw does. So tell me a little bit about how you've altered your regimens. You shared with us last time that you do many of your visits by video now, but when it comes to the actual regimen, are, are, are you trying to, to switch from IV to PO? Are you reducing frequency? What, what are you doing in your practice today? Yeah, Joe, that's a really good question. And, uh, and as we talked about before in the first round table, it does vary by region because it really has, you have to take into account the patient's risk and then the regional risk uh, to try to make the most optimal decision for the patient. I think if anything that I've learned over the past two months, it's that this isn't going away. Um, we, it's, it's not something that's just a season. It's not just something that's, you know, a two week break. It's not any of that. We are dealing with this as a nation and as a world, and particularly in the myeloma community, trying to find the best way to intersect protection with effective treatment. Based on that, I've shifted my framework a little bit. I think I've let my beacon be, my guiding beacon be do no harm as we all do as doctors. And what that means is do the best thing you can for the patient. And if I see a newly diagnosed myeloma patient, like we were talking about even earlier, I think I still think what is the best regimen for this patient? Because the reality is this, you may get COVID or there may be COVID in the ether uh, and that's a possibility, but the patient definitely has myeloma and definitely needs to get treated. And if it were my relative or my loved one or anybody that, or if it were me, I would want the most effective treatment possible. And so I've really been using that as a guidance, understanding that effective treatments can sometimes come with risks. But now that we know more about risks, about risk mitigation, it's a little bit easier for me to recommend what I think is clinically the right answer, plus added bells and whistles on that to help patients go through this process uh, with as little um, risk of COVID as possible if there is such a thing. 
Yeah, that, that's extremely helpful, Nina. And, and, you know, this has been definitely a recurring theme as we discuss through this whole series. You know, I think I've, I've probably overused the analogy, but I've given the analogy, you know, if, if a lion is about to pounce on you, do you worry if there might be a snake in the bush you're going to jump into, right? We, we have in hematologic malignancies in general, maybe we'll come back later to talk a bit about smoldering myeloma and so and MGUS and things like that, where people don't have active disease. But even from an immune basis, I know so many of my patients are afraid. I just came from clinic and we were having this conversation with some patients that they're just so afraid of COVID. And I explained to them, you know, uh, myeloma is a concern and controlling your myeloma actually is the best thing for Im your immune system. So uh, I think we share the same beacon, as you called it, uh, a guiding beacon. I think that's really important. Um, but, but has that meant that you've made any significant changes, though, again, in terms of intravenous versus oral or frequency um, in certain patients? I think that if I have a choice of oral versus IV, and I think they're equivalent, truly equivalent, then I will, I will definitely pick oral. And in that way, like we discussed before, you can also have a lot of visits that might be remote if you can get the labs to be remote. And you know, you have a good idea, sort of a good hand on the patient's pulse as far as how he or she is reacting to therapy. For example, one regimen that I've used recently is pomalidomide, cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone, which is an all oral regimen and has been a little bit easier for some of my patients uh, because I was going to choose something POM can anyway. So I didn't want to sacrifice efficacy. And I thought this might be a good thing for them to take and they could tolerate that. And th that's something you can manage with sort of labs and remote visits um, if necessary. Uh, understanding that I think that's okay for one cycle or a cycle and a half, but after a while I, I, I need to see the patient um, you know, in person um, for anything that's active chemo, for example, triple regimen. Um, for maintenance, I think for sure there is really uh, very few reasons, there are very few reasons why we have to switch to IV just yet. We really don't have data. So the only reason I would switch from oral to IV is if there was a reason of tolerance or some other reason. Understood. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And I think you, you outlined it nicely at the start that you know, when this first started, we thought, oh, maybe this is a month or two, you know, if this is really prolonged as we're now, you know, in, in mid to late May, w w this could be going on for longer. So I think that strategy is important. And, and that actually maybe brings me to the, to the second question I have with you, because again, we can kind of delay things for short term, but in the long term, we start asking questions and it's related to transplant. I mean, as we know in myeloma, it's not curative, at least autologous stem cell transplant. No, there's always the theory of potential with aloe and we can stay away from aloe today, but, but have you, I mean, you're at a relative hot spot in San Francisco, although thankfully the numbers have really declined. You know, did you take a different approach for transplant? Were you not doing it? Were you collecting and waiting? Were you not even collecting? What, what is your approach to transplant? Yeah, this issue of transplant is also very important. And exactly as you said, initially when this whole crisis hit the U.S., we all wanted to do two things. One, protect our patients, and two, protect our resources. And because of that, we did hold off on planning for transplants that had been planned, for example, within the next three weeks, because in those situations, most of the time, patients could wait a week, wait three weeks, and, and their disease is relatively well controlled because we have such great induction drugs now. Now that the time has passed, and as I said, it's a chronic issue, we realize that we have to serve our patients and, and do what's best for them. Again, like we said, it's not going away. So we've started to open up as a, one of my colleagues calls it. Now it's the thaw. Uh, we're trying, we've started to open up um, the transplant uh, machinery. And I actually think it's important because what's going to happen is, let's say everything ideally gets back to completely normal. Now you're going to have a flood of patients coming in, needing apheresis, needing their transplant dates, needing their caregivers. Now people have used up work time. You know, there's so many factors. So we want to be able to now offer transplant um, to, to patients who feel ready. And we think they're at the right spot. And many patients have actually said, I'd rather just get it over with now. You know, I'm, I'm home anyway, or my, my wife or husband is home anyway. Um, I feel like there's less traffic. I mean, there's just so many reasons uh, that people actually are starting to want to move forward with their healthcare, uh, which I understand. And again, 
we've been doing some things to risk mitigate, including testing all patients before they even start their stem cell collection and requiring home quarantine, which right now in the Bay Area is true anyway, um, for two weeks before collection and going into transplant with, again, another test before they get their high dose chemotherapy. So there are two points that we didn't have before as checkpoints that we do have now. So I feel better about that. Yeah, I think, I think that's particularly important. Uh, not to mention, I like your comment about less traffic in San Francisco. This is, this is miraculous, but, but um, it's true. It never happens. So, are you sort of strategically then testing people at, at sort of key points along the way, like right before the the collection, right before the actual um, high dose melphalan? Um, are there any other time points that you're doing in a transplant, like for those who are going through? Are you testing them when they do become neutropenic and potentially febrile in that you know day seven to eleven window, or or how how are you approaching that? Uh, well, we are only testing right now at these starting points, so where it would make a difference. So, for example, if uh, exactly as you said, right before apheresis, we want to make sure they're not an asymptomatic carrier because we know that's very common and we know people can spread disease. Uh, so, we certainly want to make sure we test people then. And then right as they get their high dose melphalan the day before that, we have a, a system in place to test them. If they're getting admitted, we'll test them the night before. Now that the turnaround time has improved, so all of these things, they just weren't there two months ago, but thankfully people have become smart about um, getting better tests, more availability of tests. It also varies by region, as you noted. Um, but now that that's there, we're, we're doing those two points. When they get febrile, um, in answer to your question, we're not testing them immediately because we probably have another reason and it's not going to change anything really from a management standpoint, except that we would isolate them to another floor, for example, if they were COVID positive. But other than that, there's no real reason, unless there's suspicion uh, for COVID, uh, we don't really do the testing. Yeah, and we've been hearing that from a lot of the larger centers that that's exactly what they're doing. That if indeed they test positive, then they move to a separate unit to to, yes. to keep them, you know, with separate ventilation and so on. So right. on the same notion, going from one extreme to another. So transplant being, you know, such an intensive treatment. Well, what about things like supportive care, in particular, you know, bone management? So often I find because I do so many second and third opinions. You know, I realize, oh, the patient never receives alondronic acid, bisphosphonate, or, you know, some may benefit from other bone strengthening agents, depending on their circumstances. What has been your approach to that? Have you continued the monthly if they're on monthly or if they're on every three months? Or did you just delay it a month? Did you discontinue it? Well, what's been your approach to the, to the uh, bone strengtheners? I'm so glad you brought this up, Joe, because I think that's like the number, it's like one to myeloma, you know, immunosuppression, it's like number five and six down there with the, with the bone supportive medication. It's so important. And the last thing you would ever want to happen is for someone to break a bone who, you know, is at risk for doing that. So um, I think that it's important that we give bisphosphonates. And I will say again, just like a theme that we're uh, talking about today, initially, I just said, okay, we don't want the patients go leaving the house and they can miss a dose of Zometa. And everyone kind of did miss a dose of Zometa. I kind of had like pause, uh, but now I've gone back to, to giving it to them. So my general rule of thumb is you don't have to come to our clinic unless you need something. And that need would be Zometa, IV chemo, um, vaccines even. I don't want people to stop getting vaccinated for all these other things out there, you know, hepatitis, et cetera, post-transplant vaccines. If you need something, I think that our clinic is clear enough now to get it. So, so that's been the way I've been approaching it. And I have been giving people their Zometa because what I don't want to happen is that we forget about all this. And again, I'm playing the long game now uh, rather than the shorter game that I was playing maybe six weeks ago. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think you're doing it very much the right thing. I think it's what many of us are doing. There's that sort of immediate, we've got to flatten the curve, flatten the curve. And now that the curve has somewhat flattened, we have to think long-term strategy. And um, and I think now, as I suspect, you know, as we discussed at the roundtable that, you know, there are programmatic things. Thankfully, our waiting rooms are either smaller or in some situations people are waiting outside in their car um, until the time comes in. So those who really need to be there can be there. Um, and, you know, we found that maybe some of our patients with, let's say, smoldering myeloma or, or, or um, monoclonal gammopathies without evidence of disease, you know, may be able to uh, conduct video visits. I, I actually think that uh, video visits are probably here to say to a certain extent. Um, I don't know if you feel the same way, if you think we're going to be doing this in the long term. Uh, but also, maybe I can ask quickly before we come to our last topic, which is, 
have you been leveraging labs outside of UCSF so that people can get their labs closer to home, maybe have a video visit so they never do have to come all the way in despite the better traffic? <laughs> I mean, is that something that you've been looking at? Because I know that there's been more partnerships between some of the academic labs and local labs, like in our situation, we've actually been able to partner with some local labs where people have their, their blood drawn there but the, the tube actually still gets sent to us. So it's still within our Epic system and we can, you know, do the trending and all the things that us geeky hematologists like to do to see the trends in labs. Yeah. Local labs is again, here to stay. It's like the new, uh, you know, if you don't have local labs, like not having Wi-Fi, you know? So um, uh, one of the things I was actually very pleasantly surprised to find out when I started at UCSF is that the Epic connection between UCSF existed with Quest and LabCorp. And so you could actually order the labs for Quest and LabCorp. And so I've been doing that for years already with a lot of my myeloma patients, again, because they're on maintenance LEN, or maybe they get followed locally and with me, something like that. And so I've really been using that a lot more. Um, and for example, for a while, Quest was allowing cancer patients or patients at risk to come at a certain hour earlier. So they, it was like the extra Costco line that they had before. So, um, and, and that was actually really helpful. So yes, for patients with, for example, smoldering myeloma or really stable maintenance, MGUS for sure, those patients who don't have new physical manifestations, I actually do recommend them to go to Quest Labs, get the labs drawn, and we have a video visit. And I think that's actually a good use of technology so that we can make room in the clinic for patients who have to get their DARA or have to get their Zomato or are getting the transplant and need to be watched. So I think this is all like moving things around like on a game board and trying to find the best strategy for each patient. Actually, the patient's love it. They're hanging out, you know, calling me from Sonoma being like, you know, I didn't want to leave Sonoma. So it's perfect that you did this quest lab and it's so nice to see you. And I get a look at their house and their view and everything. It's nice. It is quite nice. I, I did some video visits today and I, it was really nice to see a couple in their own living room. And I don't just, it was a different feel than sometimes the somewhat sterile feel that we can yes. get it. In our clinics. Well, just before we wrap up, Nina, my last quick question is about clinical trials. Because again, almost like we talked about with transplant, there was this sort of immediate, well, I guess if you're on a trial, we can continue you. And thankfully, the FDA helped us with a little bit of flexibility around, you know, less intense visits and so on. Uh, but are you now opening back up your trials? Because for a while, new enrollment was almost cut off countrywide, not just in San Francisco. Are you back now starting to enroll and open new studies? Clinical trials is another great question, especially in myeloma where we have so many of them, um, thankfully, um, and we're privileged, privileged to do so. So um, there were two things that are affecting clinical trials. One, what the institution is allowing. So our institution is a little tougher because we're in large metropolitan area. So uh, we've been restricting research staff, which means no research labs and monitoring, uh, which for anybody who conducts research, they need to be monitored by an outside force just to keep the integrity of the trial alive. And then there's the second aspect, which is the sponsor him, uh, itself. Um, for example, the large pharma companies, some of them were saying, no, we don't want to do cell therapy right now. Uh, or if we do it, everything has to be in place at your institution. Uh, we will not let you do this trial with sort of some labs and not other labs. So there's definitely been a decline um, in research, in clinical research. That being said, I have tried everything in my power to continue to do this because I feel that we shouldn't stop taking care of cancer patients because of everything going on, especially because we know more now, sort of it's still that beacon um, guiding me. Um, and I think, I truly think, and we talked about this at the last round table, one of the really pertinent silver linings here is going to be more efficient research management. I mean, if I have to sign another large binder of paper, I will think that is not a useful um, way to use trees, right? We should be doing things electronically, securely, um, efficiently so that we could get more patients on trial, get more trials through the pipeline, data managed more efficiently. We don't all have to be in the same room anymore to figure out if something was due to a trial drug or not. Um, and so I'd really like to see that taken over throughout the cancer research uh, workspace uh, so that we can get clinical trials more efficiently produced and resulted for our patients. That's beautifully said, Nina. I, I don't think I need to add anything to that. I, I completely agree with you. It has been uh, so much red tape, although it amazes me how in such a short time we were able to 
refine the way we do trials, start video visits, bill for video visits as we would face to face. Now we, we have faced this adversity quite remarkably. So thank you so much, Nina, not only for your insightful comments, but for your humor and for your humanity. Um, uh, you are such a role model to so many in the way you care for your patients and the way you conduct your research. And I'd like to thank, thank you. Everybody. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's always good to see you, Nina. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, particularly, I'd like to thank iMedics, who's helped uh, put this all together, of course. Remind you that this is CME certified, and if you wish to obtain CME credit, you can now online. Uh, and please join us in our next series, which will be the second roundtable, where we'll be going to virtually going to Chicago and Seattle, speaking with myeloid experts like Dr. Jessica Altman uh, in Chicago and Dr. Meredith Percival in, in uh, Seattle. And also we'll be speaking to both an emergency room physician and an ID specialist in Chicago uh, to share with us their insights uh, into this awful disease and how it's influenced the way we care for uh, hematological uh, malignancy. So thanks again for your attention. It's always a pleasure to have you. Uh, I will say one more thing as a bit of an appetizer for next week's uh, expert roundtable is that we've also included a patient advocate uh, who he himself, of course, is a patient, a dear friend of mine. And I know uh, that we're going to learn a great deal from Yalak next week. So thank you again for your attention. We look forward to seeing you throughout this series. Uh, have a great rest of your day.